the final lecture of this module, we'll uh, step back from looking at things just from a societal point of view and look at the entire world. Uh, and we're going to ask ourselves the question, is the globe stratified, or the planet Earth? Um, and if we look at the planet Earth as being a collection of various countries, uh, then we can clearly say, yes, uh, the world is definitely stratified on a global scale. And uh, at one time, uh, post-World War II, we might have referred to kind of the, the world as, as kind of three worlds, uh, the, first, the first, second, and third worlds. Um, and largely those were distinctions kind of uh, drawn up, like I said, in the aftermath of World War II um, along uh, political ideologies. Uh, so we would have referred to uh, the first world as America and its allies, NATO, uh, Western Europe. And we would have referred to the second world as the Soviet Union and its allies, the Warsaw Pact, largely Eastern Europe. And then the third world, uh, largely as, as everyone else. Um, and again, that, that's kind of fallen out of favor. Uh, the terminology still exists. Uh, clearly, we still use uh, some of that terminology. Uh, most often than not, we hear the term third world all the time, but we rarely ever think about it in political terms. We usually think of the third world in relationship to poverty. Uh, so if I were to say, do you name me a third world country, uh, probably, or, or just describe to me a third world country, uh, probably, you know, a, a nation with a lot of poverty and hunger, disease, famine, uh, those kind of things come to mind. And we're going to see uh, about the reality of that in just a minute. Um, and uh, again, the term first world uh, has actually become a bit of a uh, social media, well, it's a hashtag. So, you know, when I, I, I joke with students, you know, did you ever hashtag first world problems? What were you referring to? And I'll hear things like, you know, the uh, they didn't make my latte correctly, or you know, my my uh, $400 phone doesn't get good service in this area. Um, and when we say first world problems, you know, in a joking way, what we're actually recognizing is that we as a society definitely belong to the first world, and that we're generally the most privileged people in the world. And that when we complain about things, we you know, again we attach that hashtag first world problem uh, phen uh, phenomenon to it. Uh, the second world as defined by that old that definition, uh, clearly really doesn't exist anymore uh, with the absence of the Soviet Union, which dissolved in uh, late 18, uh, 1980s, uh, early 1990s. Um, so again, that, that old definition of first, second, and third world uh, has kind of fallen out of favor and much more likely to have kind of been replaced uh, with this nomenclature, the idea of looking at the world as divided up into three worlds which we generally call the most industrialized nations, the industrializing nations, and the least industrialized nations. And again, how did these changes come about? Uh, well, clearly, the key word here is industrialization. And we'll take a look at that in a historical example or context in just a minute. Um, so when we look at what are the most industrialized countries, these are clearly uh, nations around the world that have a, a firmly uh, established industrial base um, and in, even when we look at um, our societal transformation uh, discussion from a couple modules ago, have may have even you know preceded or gone beyond uh, industrial, as we sometimes talk about postmodern America uh, being an information society. But clearly, uh, have a very solid industrial base and uh, are fully in a position to take advantage of being industrialized nations. Industrializing nations, and in this we can generally uh, kind of put nations like Russia uh, and China um, among uh, some nations of South America. These are the nations around the world which are trying or expanding their industrialized base, uh, but again, still uh, maybe not made it to that level of some of those other uh, nations that I talked about. Like I said, the US, Canada, uh, Japan, Western Europe, um, largely in the most industrialized nations, uh, Australia and New Zealand also included in that. Uh, industrializing nations are those nations which are striving to uh, uh, establish or improve their industrial base. And then the least industrialized nations are those which, uh, again, very little, uh, it's not to say that there's no industry in these nations at all, but it represents generally a very uh, small percentage of uh, their, their national products, uh, and again, we definitely talk about these as the nations that don't 
benefit from a lot of the um, uh, positive uh, outcomes of being an industrialized nation. So they do have generally very high rates of uh, poverty and disease, famine, those kind of situations. So when we look at the three worlds and we look at the most industrialized, industrializing, and least industrialized nations, uh, we can clearly see that the world is stratified, much as a society would be. Uh, how did this come about? Uh, well, as we said, the most important thing is uh, when we take into account uh, industrialization, one of the explanations we can give for why the world is stratified this way is colonialism. Uh, there is a video uh, that I've put in the D2L shell uh, that uh, exemplifies some of what I'm saying. Uh, if you'd like to choose to watch it now or just wait till I finish this discussion, I'll pause for a second so you can take a look at that video. Um, it's called The Scramble for Africa. Uh, and when we think about colonialism, uh, we recognize even ourselves, uh, America started out as a colony of the British Empire, but you can actually say that that occurred roughly about the same time, if not slightly even before uh, this, this rapid industrialization, uh, the Industrial Revolution that spread around the world. Um, specifically, when we talk about almost all the nations in the continent of Africa, we can clearly see that uh, colonialism, well, we'll start from the beginning. Uh, some nations industrialized very quickly and very rapidly, and that's where industrialization started. Uh, the very first factory was built in England uh, in the 1600s or late 17, or I'm sorry, late, early 1700s. Um, but clearly, Western European, European nations and industrialization spread very quickly to other similar cultures. Uh, Western European nations in the middle of the 1700s, well into the 1800s, uh, industrialized very quickly and very rapidly. Uh, and then, since that gave them the jump on other countries, because along with rapid industrialization, comes a uh, huge advance in, specifically, among other things, uh, military power. So uh, if you think about the ways that wars were waged for thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years of human existence, uh, they were waged with rocks and spears and later on some you know, uh, more advanced weapons like uh, swords and crossbows and catapults and things like that. But the ability for one side to gain a huge advantage of the other really didn't exist. Uh, suddenly with industrialization, nations that became industrialized had huge advantages militarily. So instead of bows and arrows, now we're talking machine guns. Instead of horses, tanks. Instead of uh, boats, uh, warships. Uh, and then later on, of course, things like airplanes and even much more advanced weapons than that. So this uh, this huge advantage that these countries, and sometimes very small countries, had over other places around the world militarily gave them these huge advantages. And I'll pause now for a second, and you can watch the, uh, the uh, Scramble for Africa video. Okay. What we can clearly see is that places around the world that were not subject to this early uh, industrialization, you can think about them literally, and the phrase came from the video, where, you know, like cake, cut up. Uh, so uh, if you looked at that map of Africa and saw basically how different nations came in and just seized enormous chunks of it, uh, because again, industrializing nations need natural resources as well as labor, uh, so they would go into these places around the world that were not industrialized and with their superior military technology, just take over and take what they wanted. Uh, so even when we see little tiny European countries like Belgium uh, could take over you know, enormous areas in the interior of Africa, uh, again known as the Belgian Congo. Um, and when we look at some of the, uh, and, uh, and, and obviously then exploit those areas for their natural resources and labor. Uh, when we look at some of the long-term consequences of these things, we recognize that uh, most colonial boundaries were not in any way drawn or established with any consideration for the cultures or people that existed there. So many times uh, people of different cultures were grouped together uh, into one colony and in, in, in a lot of ways sometimes pitted against each other for the purposes of maintaining control. Uh, in other situations, cultures might be split up and, uh, and separated uh, by being in two separate colonies, therefore obviously weakening or diminishing them. Um, 
So we clearly see that uh, today's, uh, especially again, when we talk about the continent of Africa, but many places around the world, much of the <coughs> cultural, religious, ethnic disputes that we see go around the world had a lot of their results or their uh, roots, I should say, uh, in the practice of uh, colonialism, which went on, uh, like I said, mainly uh, the entire industrialized time. Many of the nations uh, around the world that were colonized actually didn't gain their independence uh, until the, sometime, in some cases, the late 20th century. Uh, another way of looking at <clears throat> why the world is stratified uh, is what uh, sociologist uh, and theorist uh, Emmanuel Wallerstein referred to in the 90s uh, as world systems theory. Again, very close to what we were talking about already with colonialism and the three worlds. Uh, the idea is that Wallerstein uh, talks again about kind of three uh, groups of nations around the world and that as, as the world uh, has become more and more and more interconnected, again, this kind of globalization, that uh, countries fall into one of three categories uh, which he, you can kind of think of as, uh, think of the core nations, and then he talks about kind of radiating spheres of influence. He talks about the second group as being what he called the semi-periphery, and then on the outside, the peripheral nations. And basically what Wallerstein is referring to is uh, the relationships between not just economics and military power, but also uh, political power, and just this idea of the relationship between these three groups of nations when we look at the entire world. So the core nations are those, and again, they fall very much in line with our definitions of the three worlds. Uh, when we look at core nations, we think of nations like uh, the United States, um, many, many Western European nations. Um, you know, uh, we look at Japan. Um, that distinguish themselves as basically being the, the, the countries that exert the most power in the world. Uh, they're the ones, again, militarily, economically, but in a lot of cases socially, um, politically, exert the most power. They're the ones who do the most consuming around the world. The semi-peripheral nations are those nations which are trying to put themselves into positions to become core nations. So again, we think about countries like China and Russia. Uh, that are desperately trying, like we said, in a lot of ways, to build their economies, build their militaries, uh, sometimes just through uh, population, as we've seen in China, and to a certain degree, India. We can say that um, these nations are making a play for becoming core nations, but they haven't quite achieved that status yet. <clears throat> Again, they don't have to be large nations like that. We can also talk about nations perhaps like, like, like Venezuela, uh, which controls a lot of oil in uh, South America. Uh, we could talk about nations perhaps like Ireland uh, and Europe, which has a, a pretty booming tech industry. And then we talk about the peripheral nations around the world. These are nations which are largely characterized as having very little power and spend a lot of their resources kind of funneling resources, uh, natural resources, uh, toward the semi periphery and core nations. So again, kind of corresponds with that idea of the least industrial or third world nations around the world. So Wallerstein, again, is just kind of exactly what it means, world systems. If we look at the world as interconnected systems, these are how they basically relate to each other. And uh, the very last one we're going to put in here, uh, so these, obviously, colonialism and world systems theories take a look at things from a macro standpoint. Um, anthropologist and sociologist John Galbraith uh, took a look at the idea of, from a micro sociological or symbolic interactionist point of view, are there certain things about some cultures around the world which contribute to global stratification? And he proposed that in some ways there does exist what he called a culture of poverty. So these would be beliefs, ideals, and values uh, which he said uh, exist in some cultures which may be contributing factors to this stratification. Uh, some of the things he says are ideas such as some of the cultures of what we would call developing or third world nations actually serve to hold back uh, their development. Uh, one of the things he basically points out is that uh, in a lot of developing countries, uh, people who live at or very close uh, to the level of starvation are often extremely reluctant to try out either new technologies or new ideas. Uh, not because, again, of a, of a sense of not wanting to succeed, 
but more of a fear of failure that uh, the culture of these uh, areas say, if you try something and it doesn't work, you're likely to die, so therefore better just do things the way that they've always been done. And again, we can say that many people from industrialized nations find these attitudes very confusing. Um, you know, when Americans, for instance, come into, let's say, a third world nation and say, let's do things this way, let's try to grow this crop, let's improve this or that, and they find a, a strong reluctance among the people who live there, we often take it, as I said, ethnocentrically, as resistance. And really what Galbraith is pointing out is it's more of a fear of failure, because a fear of failure is much more likely to result in death uh, than, in, than we would experience in uh, industrialized countries. Um, also, Galbraith points out that a lot of religions around the world contain a strong element of fatalism, uh, kind of what we talked about before. Um, the idea of fate is that idea that you know history and the future uh, are, are to a large degree out of our hands. There, and especially the future is predetermined. Um, so if a religion or, or value system uh, contains a, a large element of fatalism to it, then the answer, why are you in the position you're in, is simply answered with, that's just the way things are. Or it's no use to do anything about it uh, because nothing's going to change. So this idea of fatalism is something that Galbraith points out as a, as a possible contributor uh, to this idea of global stratification. So we know the world is stratified, and we know that many places around the world are very unhappy with the way the world is stratified. So we can kind of talk about the idea of, well, how is this stratification maintained? Much as we did earlier when we talked about how do elites maintain stratification, we can say, are there some things that some of the more and more, most industrialized nations around the world do to maintain uh, this stratification. And we can clearly point out a couple of different factors. One is the idea of neo-colonialism. So of colonialism, uh, as we talked about before, uh, taking over various parts of the world through military power, uh, which as we definitely, you know, if we look at modern culture, uh, we know that colonialism around the world has largely been uh, outlawed or discontinued. Um, so has that been replaced? And the answer is, uh, well, according to this, uh, we've resorted now to something called neo-colonialism, again, a new type of colonialism, in which military power has basically been replaced with economic debt. Uh, so the basic idea behind neo-colonialism is that these least industrialized nations borrow money. Uh, they borrow money largely from the most industrialized nations. Uh, they want things that are, exist in the most industrialized nations, industrialization to a large degree, but also things like airports and roads and communication systems and hospitals and clean water, uh, and a lot of times military power to protect themselves uh, and either to engage in uh, long-lasting or long-standing disputes or just to protect themselves, and they borrow those things. They borrow either the funds for them or they're given those things um, uh, which places them in situations of what was sometimes called eternal debtors. Uh, some of us may relate to this idea of you know being in debt that you'll feel you'll never be able to pay off, and that kind of leaves you at the mercy of the people that you owe money to. And when we talk about this idea of neo-colonialism, we talk about this idea that these least industrial nations, uh, despite the fact they may have, they may be rich in natural resources or uh, you know, uh, have a lot of things which could contribute to them uh, becoming, again, more uh, industrialized nations, or in uh, uh, Wallerstein's world systems theory, at least move from periphery to semi-peripheral nations. But the fact is that they are, when it comes time to engaging in trade, especially with the most industrialized nations, that those most industrialized nations, because of this relationship of debt, uh, have the ability to set uh, the terms of trade. So you could say that a small uh, and uh, least industrialized nation could have a valuable resource such as oil or uranium and want to obviously set the price for that, but it's the most industrialized nations, especially those that they owe money to, which will be the ones that dictate the terms of trade. So in other words, you know, think about if you were uh, you know, calling up your, you, know, you owe a lot of money to a credit card company and then your credit card company you say to them, you know, they say, oh, we'll buy some of your things uh, to settle that debt, but they're going to tell you how much they're going to pay for it. Okay? Chances are you probably would never get out of debt and always be in that position. So again, the idea of neo-colonialism 
is uh, a new type of colonialism, uh, mainly based on economics, not military power. Uh, we're going to talk about the influence of multinational corporations around the world. Uh, the majority of multinational corporations or those businesses that operate across uh, uh, national boundaries uh, originate in the most industrialized nations. So when we think of the biggest industrial or uh, multinational corporations, we usually think of uh, the United States, we think of Japan, we think of Germany, um, and these countries, you know, the, these companies that go around the world are operating across international board, uh, boundaries have roots in, and in a lot of cases, loyalties toward uh, the most industrialized nations. Um, <clears throat> they absolutely contribute to a certain degree to this global stratification. Uh, in a lot of cases, by funneling wealth uh, into the elite within the least industrialized nations. So in order to get uh, things like uh, <clears throat> trade agreements done or uh, rights to natural resources, those kind of things, um, in a sense, uh, the rich get richer in the poorer countries and uh, the, the interactions or dealings that these countries make with multinational corporations don't benefit the people as a whole, but generally tend to benefit just the elite in those countries so that the stratification is maintained on the national level, uh, which contributes again to the global stratification. Um, also, we sometimes talk about multinational corporations contributing to what we call boom and bust economic cycles. Uh, again, if you have a background in economics, uh, basically we just know that when we talk about economic growth, especially on a national scale, uh, most economic growth that's considered positive is very slow and steady. So even in the United States when we talk about uh, you know, an increase in the you know, uh, GDP of 1% or 0.8%, you know, and you hear people getting all excited about that, and it sounds like it's not that much, Slow, steady growth is an economic uh, plus. And when multinational corporations come into small nations, again, let's say it's a small nation that discovers it has a uh, valuable resource, such as, let's say, uranium. Uh, and a multinational corporation comes in and says, you know, we can mine that uranium for you. Uh, then the, multi the, the least industrialized nation generally has little uh, power. They have no technology to do that themselves, nor would they be able to sell it. Uh, to anybody but, let's say, perhaps a multinational corporation. Um, so the multinational corporation will come in and, let's say, set up a mining uh, uh, situation. Well, what's going to happen around that area or in the economy in that country? There's going to be a boom, okay? So other, in uh, other industries, uh, entertainment and tourism and hotels and transportation will all spring up, and that economy will experience a huge surge upwards um, and then, unfortunately, not exist for very long, uh, again, contributing to the bust economy. So if that, then that resource runs out or the multinational corporation concludes its business, then the local economy fails. And we know, again, that whatever goes up quickly comes down the other side, uh, is much likely to be in a worse position than when it was when it started. Uh, so the idea of boom and bust economies is often very, uh, damaging uh, to least industrialized countries. And the last thing we can definitely say is the role of technology. Technology being tools, ways that, again, industrialized nations accomplish things. When we look at where does technology originate, we clearly say that if, uh, let's say, the United States wants a new uh, communication, satellite communication system, it is most likely then to produce and make it themselves. Uh, whereas if a uh, least industrialized nation wants something like a nuclear power plant or a global communication satellite. Uh, it has, does not have the ability to make that, uh, produce that themselves. They have to purchase it uh, from most industrialized nations, which as I said earlier, can not only set the standards of trade, but in a lot of cases, the uh, least industrialized nations are not in a position to be able to afford those things. Uh, they wind up, again, uh, the analogy I use a lot of times with students is, you know, if you're buying your first car and you walk onto the lot, you normally don't ask to see, you know, uh, that, that year's model latest cars, the brand new ones, right? So you don't walk in and say, you know, show me the new BMWs. You're probably in a position based on, again, the, the, the car dealership's uh, at, uh, assessment of your ability to pay them back, uh, you know, the later model cars. And you might wind up driving a junker uh, 
off the lot because it's the most you can get or the most you can afford. Um, and then you'll drive that around for four or five years and at the end of that time, by the time that car is finally dead or you're in a position to get something else, and you count it all up, you realize you spent more money into maintaining that old car than perhaps you would have had you been in the position to be able to buy a new car in the first place. Well, again, that's what a lot of these lease industrialized nations uh, experience. So they're buying up old and outdated technology uh, for the purposes of not being able to get any better and then they spend sometimes years, if not decades, uh, kind of keeping that old technology running um, at a greater expense than if they were able to acquire it firsthand. So um, when we talk about this idea of global stratification, we can clearly see uh, the world is stratified. We looked at some of the causes of it and some of the ways that it is currently maintained. <coughs>